Hello and welcome to a cover story conversation. We have with us Dr. Shashi Tharoor, three-term MP from Trivandrum. He's also former union minister and easily the Congress party's most articulate face. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, welcome back to this conversation. I met you in April, just when the election started, I think in the middle of your own election. That's right, in Thiruvananthapuram. Thiruvananthapuram, mm. which I always stumble over, so I said <laughs> Trivandrum. But now, now we are now nearly at the end of the election. So you had at that time predicted that the Congress and the alliance would actually win. Are you still holding on to that? Very strong. So, in fact, everything that's happened since then mm -hmm. has confirmed what I said to you then. If anything, what we're looking at right now seems to be apparently a better result than we could have hoped for at that time. You remember my logic mm. was based mainly on the fact that they had maxed out in 2019 in too Correct. many states where they were mm. strong. Um, but that is now actually, for example, I would not have been able to say at that time that we will do as well in many places in UP as the India Alliance is doing right now. If you look at feedback from UP, hmm. uh, it's it's looking very impressive that, you know, instead of people saying BJP will go up from the 64 or 65 seats they had last time, now everyone's accepting the BJP is going to go down from there. So there's some very interesting changes and I believe we're looking at a very good set of results on the 4th of June. So explain good. For Congress, what is good? I mean, for you to even, if you get 100, that's great. But uh, for the, I mean, the gap is so wide that the good means no, the different. The gap is wide, but we're not looking necessarily hmm. at getting more seats in the BJP. Right. We're looking at the India Alliance doing better than NDA. But see, NDA hmm. is purely a, a figment of, of the BJP's imagination. In that, if you look at the allies, hmm. that is Mr. Shinde's uh, faction and Ajit Pawar's faction, and uh, Nitish Kumar's rather sorry looking Correct. apology for a JDU. <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, Alta and, and poor Jayan Chaudhary is only in two constituencies. Ultimately, apart from Chandra Babu Naidu, there is no real party in the fray of any consequence. Uh, and I don't think those four parties put together where you are going to come up with more than 10 seats amongst them. So the only thing is how many will Chandra Babu manage to win in, in Andhra? Hmm. Uh, and, and how much, therefore, will this collectivity be able to contribute to the BJP getting to 272? Now, if all indications are that they're dropping well below the majority mark of 272, the BJP, mm. then they will need the allies to give them the, the balance. Correct. And they're not going to get that from this particular sorry bunch of allies. So I think we're looking at a situation where the story is pretty much over. Having said that, mm. I'm not saying that we alone may necessarily get 272. I'm saying that there will be a situation at which we will do extremely well with our allies. And then the fence sitters mm. will have the option. And I have no doubt which of the two options they will leave, uh, they will uh, turn to. I mean, who wants to go to bed with a wolf when you know you might end up as a wolf's breakfast in the morning? So the <laughs> net result is they're going to come to the more decent set of options, namely the India Alliance, where they'll be treated with respect and uh, where they will have a say. And so I think they'll be heading towards a, a good coalition government of the kind that the country has seen uh, many times now in the last uh, 25 years, and a coalition government which... Again, the track record of coalition governments in India is that they brought very, very good economic growth and progress uh, to the country. Hmm. So this is what I'm looking forward to after the 4th of June. Okay, how have you seen the narrative so far? You know, we've seen, I think there's an analysis of the Prime Minister's speeches somebody's done. He began, I think, by talking about development and the Congress, but, you know, it was 50-50. Towards the middle, he's gone on to the Hindu-Muslim narrative. And, uh, yeah, but, you know, you, the Congress is also to blame for it, all this reservation for minorities. Uh, you're asking no, no, we, to be... We never raise that issue. I'm sorry. Hmm. That is simply not true. So Priya. what... Huh? Our manifesto doesn't mention reservation for minorities at all. Doesn't mention uh, the word Muslim, doesn't mention the word reservations. In that context, doesn't mention redistribution. All of these, the BJP, starting with the Prime Minister and his leading campaigners, have chosen to read into our manifesto, which wasn't there. Hmm. Now, I'm a member of the manifesto committee. Right. I can authoritatively tell you we never discussed any of these issues. They weren't even part of the conversation. And I didn't miss a single meeting of the committee, so I can tell you that this was never discussed. This is not an issue. It's not our agenda. We did not raise it. It is that when our manifesto came out, hmm. and the BJP, frankly, came later and a rather lame, limp sort of document, they had nothing much to say for themselves. Instead, they decided to ascribe to our manifesto things that are not in it. As I've said, there's only one version of the manifesto. You can Google it. You can find mm. it. Our Nyai Patra, as we call it. There is nothing there that corresponds to what the BJP say. So I think what has happened is, frankly, mm. in 2014, they had the Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas develop a narrative. Correct. The experience 
destroyed that because of the disaster of demonetization, hmm. the botched rollout of GST, everything. People suffered terribly in economics. Hmm. Then Pulwama happened, Balakot was the response. They converted 2019, hmm. which could have been a referendum on their economic failure. Instead, it became a national security election, and right. that became the narrative. So in both 14 and 19, they had the dominant narrative. Hmm. Now in 24, they couldn't go for national security again hmm. either because they've been humiliated by the Chinese on our border, where 65 patrolling points exist where both armies used to patrol for the last 46 years. In 26 of those points, our army is unable to go and patrol. Hmm. And that is a complete admission of defeat by the, by, the, by the BJP government. And on one occasion, when our fellows went unarmed and told the Chinese, what are you doing here? It's our turn to patrol, buzz off. The Chinese threw them off a cliff and killed 20 of them, right? So you're looking at a situation where we have been badly treated. So that narrative is gone. What does that leave them with? Hindu Hridaya Samrat, huh? Hindutva, Ram Mandir. And that's what they tried to make the narrative. The Congress party, on the other hand, focused on the well-being of the ordinary Indian. We didn't attack them on their narrative. We just said to people, what about unemployment? What about price rise? Can you afford the market what you could afford two years ago? Has this government been good for you and your family? Where is what has been your experience? And people began realizing they don't elect governments to build mandirs. They elect governments to look after their welfare. And their welfare has not been looked after. This is how the BJP completely lost control of the narrative. And they started flailing about attacking the Congress on imaginary things that were not in the manifesto hmm. and attacking us on, um, on this business of uh, Hindu-Muslim appeasement and so on, which frankly is a very tired trope. And but I think most is... people are no longer are going to be moved by that. See, I, uh, I, about that, you know, the whole argument is that it's not development that wins elections as much as emotion. And for them, this Hindu card is emotional enough uh, to appeal to 80% of us. I think the people who are already going to be moved by that kind of message were already voting for the BJP so anyway. Okay. Hmm. I mean, the, see, the strength of the BJP in both 14 and 19 hmm. was it attracted some people who are not Hindutva true believers, hmm. but who are attracted A, by the development narrative, B, by the national security narrative. Where are they going to get these people from this time? I think what the BJP is discovering is they have a core vote of Hindutva, but there is a ceiling to how far that goes. What they need was an extra message that could give them the additional voters. There were people in 14 who voted for Mr. Modi, who in 09 had voted for us. Hmm. The people in 19 who voted for Mr. Modi, who in the previous elections had voted for us. So we stayed, as it were, at a level of 19.5, 19.6%, almost 20%, which was not enough for us to win a national election. Whereas the BJP, which had actually never crossed 25% before Mr. Modi, mm -hmm. suddenly found themselves in the 30s. 31% in uh, 14, 37% in 19. This is the difference. So where did that extra 6% come in the first election? Development. Where did the 10% come in or the 6% more come in the second election? National security. This is why the BJP needs a narrative beyond Hindutva. Hindutva alone does not appeal to a majority of Hindus. And that's something that I think people looking objectively, talking to people around the country will tell you. Hmm. If you take India as a whole, there is a sort of shelf life to this narrative. And I think the BJP has uh, realized that, which is why the desperation and the inflammatory rhetoric and then the bizarre contradictions in Mr. Modi's statements. Like? Like saying, you know, if I raise Hindu-Muslim <laughs> issues, I'm not fit to be prime minister, I'm not fit to be a public servant. So well, that's what we're telling him. I have written a column saying, Mr. Prime Minister, for God's sake, for in the name of decency, stop this. This is not worthy of you as prime minister to talk like this. So then uh, we had an interview with, he gave an interview to NewsX, uh, in fact, and uh, he raised this issue. He says, you know, I am not the one. He's saying, he quoted, of course, Manmohan Singh's statement. And he's saying it is Congress that is practicing uh, communalism with the garb of secularism with the appeasement politics. That is the now, nutshell. Mr. Manmohan Singh's statement was in 2006. The BGP raised objections at that time. Hmm. Mr. Manmohan Singh's office issued clarifications at that time. And he continued being prime minister for eight years and didn't do what the BJP claims the statement would have authorized him to do. Right. So if eight years after he mm. made the statement, he continued running this country and he didn't do all those things, why should the Congress, which has not repeated that statement, suddenly do it now 20 years later? It makes no sense, this kind of talk. 
does I mean it's like really attacking Mr Modi for something said by let's say uh, Mr Balraj Madhok or something like that one of those early <laughs> Jansang leaders which was never implemented by the Jansang you say no Mr Modi is going to do it now because his leader said it then that makes no sense did you you know you are the right, uh, right person the manifesto does your manifesto talk about giving uh, government contracts to uh, you know having a quota for government contracts a minority quota for government contracts no, it doesn't no. there is no such no. Uh, uh, no, 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 not at all. What we have said basically hmm. in the manifesto is a need for social justice. We've talked about five kinds of nyai, huh. and the five categories we have singled out are youth, yuva, women, maila, shramik, laborers, kisan, farmers, and then there is a hissedari category, which is all those, and that talks about the need for us to get a decent. Awareness of what's going on in the country in terms of a socio-economic caste census, and ensure that rights are given, and not just, by the way, hmm. to any particular category. We talk about jal jungle zameen for the hmm. Adivasis. We talk about SCSTs as well. I mean, SCST category reservations, um, and we do not mention any particular religious group at all in that in that conversation. What we're saying is. Give people rights. Give them justice. This has been our philosophy for ten years under UPA. What do we do? We encourage liberalisation. We encourage growth. But the revenues that came to the government from liberalisation, we made sure it was given to benefit those who are otherwise excluded, marginalised, sidelined. That's the kind of governance we've offered before, and we're ready to offer again. But uh, you know, uh, you are accusing them of playing religion-based politics. They are saying you are playing caste-based politics. So who is talking development here? You are also talking caste. They are talking mandal ka mandal. We have gone back to those that VP Singh election. We, we are as much into development as they are. In fact, we are very proud of the fact that we are the ones who inaugurated the whole liberalisation scheme and the transformation hmm. of the Indian economy since '91. I think even Mr Modi will accept that from '91 hmm. to 2011, 20 years, hmm. were the best 20 years of India's economy ever. He hasn't come anywhere close to that in his 10 years of rule, right? So you've got a, a, a track record on the part of the Congress hmm. making me proud of. When you have growth like that, government revenues go up. Now we are saying we will be very happy to spend those revenues ensuring social justice for those who frankly need it. Hmm. Sadly, in Mr. Modi's regime, we have seen the number of people in need going up. Why is it that 80 crore Indians are getting free grain? Why is it that so many people are looking for jobs being unable to find it? Why is it that 45% of all those of the job starting age group from 19 to 25 can't find a job. I mean, these are all issues that we have to grapple with. And we're saying we're aware of these issues. We will address them responsibly. That's it. That's the main difference between us and the BJP. Both sides can talk about development. Mm. Who's against Vikas? Mm. We're all for development. Question is, what do you do once you've done development? Who gets that benefit? It's the same argument as 2004. BJP said India shining. Mm. We said, but who is India shining for? And that was what carried the day. So you're talking that inclusive uh, is yeah. not reached. Inclusive to India is our message. Go oh, totally. But you know, you guys were right on uh, China. You were right on demonetization. You were right on GST. You've been right on the economy. The uh, warning from COVID came first from the Congress. Yet, despite all this, you're not winning an election. So what is? how does it say the people that you're right all the time, yet you don't have the credibility to carry that message across? No, well, they're propaganda, they're publicity, but they're are WhatsApp not, no. groups. They're now, even the Congress is very good at it. Uh, no, we're getting better at it, definitely. But I'm saying that may explain it to a great extent. I mean, the fact is that, again, all those things wear off after a while. Hmm. They have had the benefit of doing all that, and they've managed to still win. Uh, and as you rightly said, we have been right on pretty much every key national issue. And, and yet what you're is more, losing we have elections. Been right, we have been right um, time and time again. And we've been right in a way that um, uh, we ourselves have not been boasting enough about. <laughs> no, that is honest. not what I meant, that you don't have bragging <laughs> rights. <laughs> but, uh, but the truth is that, nonetheless... Um, uh, we have finally come to a point where voters are realizing, hey, wait a minute, hmm. this is a party that we can trust and rely upon, have faith in. And that's where we will once again come back. But, uh, you know, we've seen uh, Rahul Gandhi always gets crowds, you know, I think th there are still crowds, but the conversion to votes doesn't happen. So this time also, how does one, you know... Uh, we well, that we'll only know on the 4th of June. Hmm. But I'm just saying that from what I've seen, 
we are seeing enthusiasm. I mean, if you take my own constituency, you know, after I voted in the morning, I went from uh, well, there are thousand booths in my constituency. Mm. I can't go there in one day, but I went to about 70, 75. Saw the people at the table sitting outside the booths and so on. Our party workers, enthusiastic, happy, lots of people had come to ask well, That is Shashi Tharoor's constituency, and which you nurtured for three terms. I don't think the rest of India is. Who's uh, come back for three but, terms? But, 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 which Congress people MP? People are saying that that's also a ground for anti incumbency. So, strictly speaking, the fact that I've been there for three terms does not necessarily an advantage. It could be that people say, sick of this guy's face, let's change it. But instead, what we were seeing was enthusiasm for us. And what we were hearing was either glumness on the faces of the two rivals or absence from their tables of anybody. Now, this kind of thing hmm. is what we're seeing in other parts of the country. What struck me was when I started hearing similar stories from the Hindi-speaking states. Which Those is? districts that had voted at the same time as us, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, UP, hmm. we were hearing similar stories. Strongholds of the BJP, less of a turnout. Where the uh, our, our people were looking for votes, people coming, smiling, supporting. Very, very interesting prayer. I'm telling you right now in advance that no one can accuse me of saying it. I'll sour grapes later. Huh. Even the exit polls will not tell the full picture. Because in our country today, after 10 years of BJP's fear mongering, a lot of people are not going to answer truthfully the exit pollsters. They're going to say, ha ha. We voted for the government because they're they are not sure who's asking the question, hmm. whether their answer would reach the government and they'll have some consequences. So they'll say we voted for the ruling party. Uh, many. But I'm just saying that in reality, discount that, you're going to get a much better result on June 4th than anybody would predict even on June 1st. Okay, well, you've said it first here, but uh, I'm still not, you know, uh, we've seen, like I said, I come back to that argument that it is emotions that win and Prime Minister still has it. We are not seeing an anti-Modi way. We may see a Modi fatigue, we may see, uh, you know, uh, there's no anger against him. Maybe that whole brand Modi is not... Yeah, I've uh, heard this uh, argument from Prashant <laughs> Kishore as well, <laughs> that uh, people are not happy, but they're not angry. Huh. I mean, come on, that may be the decency and goodness of the Indian people. But if they're not happy, they certainly can look for alternatives, right? That joy is mm. not coming at Rahul's name either or at whoever's name. So what we're saying is we're offering a collective alternative. We are offering an alternative where in each state they can find somebody they like to turn to. It may be Tejasvi in Bihar, it may be Akhilesh in UP, it may be Mamta in Bengal, it may be Stalin in Tamil Nadu, it may be Uddhav and, and Sharad Pawar Sahab in, uh, in Maharashtra. Mm. But people will be able to support their favorites, in addition to the Congress voters who are supporting Rahul Ji and Karge Ji. Now, that's something which, at the end of the day, these netas will sit together and pick a leader. We're not too worried about this, honestly. Mm. I mean, I think that if you look at the history of coalition government starting from 91, I mean, technically, Narasimha Rao's was a minority government, but not a coalition government. Mm. From 96, every government in India, right up to Mr. Modi, was a coalition government, the best periods of growth were under them. No, I agree. Coalition governments do at least uh, go in for more consensus. Uh, thing. But at That's the end, right. of, but India was so tired of that coalition government of UPA that they were looking for, I mean, you guys actually brought him in. by They wanted a strong leadership, decisive leadership, because the Congress watered down the Prime Minister, office of the Prime Minister so much. You no, know, look, strong leadership is all very well. But hmm. If you look at the circumstances in 2014, we got this whammy, as it were, of the whole India Against Corruption movement Correct. of Anna Hazari, which was somehow distorted to look as if the only corrupt people in India are the Congress Party, hmm. which, as we all know, including from our experience since then, is simply not true. And secondly, there was this very effective, in those days, BJP was much more effective than we were on media and social media, portrayal of so-called policy paralysis in the UPA government, which again was not true. The UPA government had come up with so many creative and effective UPA laws. UPA 1. No, some of them continued in UPA 2. Um, yes, we had the right to information in UPA 1. We had the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee in UPA 1. We had the Indo-US Nuclear Deal in UPA 1. Mm. And we also had the uh, right to education mm. coming through in UPA 1. But in UPA 2... You had all the scams. We had the continuation of some of these things. We had the Land uh, Acquisition Act in UPA 2. We had the Forest Rights strengthening in UPA too. We had certainly um, a number of, of concrete mm. implementations of the earlier decisions in UPA too. And yes, we had this whole shock of the CAG suggesting there was a loss 
a notional loss in the 2G Correct, huh? uh, affair, which later turned out to be discredited completely, even by the courts. There was no loss. Hmm. And in fact, the Indian public got cheaper phone calls as a result uh, of the 2G allocations. Uh, we had uh, the, the bad news coming out hmm. of the uh, Anazare movement. Uh, and so all of these things came together and constituted the perfect storm. And at the same time, I will admit we were very unlucky with international oil prices. The Congress party kept subsidizing oil prices to the extent possible until it became unsustainable because oil prices went up to $140 a barrel. Mr. Modi's biggest luck was hmm. that under UPA, the government, I mean, the people got used to paying rather high prices for their petrol. But then the international market crashed. Mr. Modi didn't reduce prices for the Indian voter very much. Right. He kept them all, but the difference was he was collecting more tax on each liter. And so government revenues went up. The Indian voter did not benefit, but the international prices actually went down. Had Congress followed its policy after 2014, if we'd been in power, when international prices dropped, so would the prices of the pump have dropped. But that didn't happen in India. So let's face it. A number of things have happened. We can sit and diagnose until we're blue in the face. But I don't think that the judgment of UPA2 is fair at all. That's implicit in your question. Okay, last two questions. One is, has the BJP succeeded in making the Congress apologetic about the dynasty? You know, we've seen only Rahul contest. There was a chance Priyanka could have, but I'm told he didn't want the whole family in the house at the same time. So is the Congress on a back foot on the dynasty? No, look, I, I think this dynasty thing is overblown. First mm. of all, because most Indians tend not to object very much to this because most Indians in their own lives ah, tend to uh, uh, you know, follow Parivar Vad. I mean, my dentist, his children are dentists, my eye doctor, his children are mm. eye doctors. I mean, honestly, uh, it's, it's not funny, but this is simply our culture. It's the mm. way it is. Um, and, you know, uh, Sachin Tendulkar's son just paid for Mumbai Indians. I mean, come on. Uh -huh. it's, it's in our blood. This seems to be our culture, number one. Mm. Number two and more important, the BJP party has plenty of Parivar cases. I think They've taken done, your parivar, actually. I beg your pardon? They've taken a lot of your parivar vads uh, from Sindhya to Jitin. There you are, to those two, those yeah. two. But they have so many. I mean, the Mahajans are there, the Mundes are there. I mean, you've got the Anurag Thakur's brother and so on and so forth. You've got... And, and doesn't mean that they only have to be in politics. I mean, Amit Shah's son is in cricket, but I mean, that's very powerful these days in India. So you've got all of these things. The family is hmm. being well looked after by their, <laughs> by, their, by their own for quite some time. And I wouldn't really say that this has a huge amount of traction. But having said that, we do have two members of the Gandhi family, Sonia Ji and Rahul Ji, who are active in politics. And Priyanka is not exactly inactive. She's been our most effective campaigner in the last few weeks. And I've had the pleasure of her coming to campaign for me in Tiruvannathapuram. She's a natural. I mean, she's really very effective. And I have no doubt in my mind that she has a great future in public life and in politics in particular. They will choose their own time and it will come. Okay, last question. I had noticed that you found time to watch an IPL match, Rajasthan one. Royals. One <laughs> match because of Sanju Samson. <laughs> That's right. Well, he's from my constituency. I've known him since he was 14. I've really followed his career with a great deal of pride. And all of, all of Kerala, frankly, he's not only from Tiruvananthapuram. He's the only Keralite in the IPL who's doing particularly well. Um, there, there's one guy called Sandeep Warrior who grew up in Kerala mm -hmm. and was our player, but since then has moved to Tamil Nadu. And of course, people like Devdat Padikala, Malayali, but played for Karnataka. So ultimately, from Kerala, there's only Sanju Samson. So he's very much the pride of all of us. And we were rooting for him to you know, break back into the Indian team, which he did. This particular match that I saw, he played a great innings. Very unlucky to be given out caught on the boundary when... The camera showed very clearly the fielder's foot was touching the rope. But because the rope didn't move, hmm. he was given out. And um, and we um, we all then witnessed uh, Rajasthan Royals losing that match. And that began the beginning of their slide. They've lost four or five okay. matches in a row, and now they're no longer in the top two. Whereas in those days, they were the number one team. But having said all of that, IPL is a lot of fun. Cricket, for me, is a great joy. And somehow the other one will have to find, if not time to watch these matches in the last 10 days of campaigning, at least the highlights are going to try and get recorded so I can watch them at some point. Okay, I've got your election prediction. Do I have an IPL prediction from you? Well, no, I would have said Royals in a different era. But today, they've, they've lost too many matches in a row for me to do that confidently. I think that uh, what's interesting is that it's so unpredictable. Any of the four teams could still surprise and wouldn't be such a big surprise.
let's see how it goes. Unpredictable but still great fun. I think that sums up Shashi Tharoor also. But thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, Priya. Good to see you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.